Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that law of my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm so glad to have you join me on the podcast today. And here's something very special to me, very close to me and my family. As some of you may know, my wife and I, for the first five years of our marriage, have lived in a fifth wheel camper. We rednecked a little 10 by 10 room on the side of that and um, and have been praying about possibly getting into a house. It was our goal to get into a house a year after we were married, Um, but some things fell in our way. And so I tell the story in today's episode of our journey along the way, all the way through to how God miraculously provided a house for us. There were so many roadblocks that came up, so many doors that slammed shut, but God had His will and His way, and He had His hand upon every single aspect, and so it's an absolutely incredible story. And I said several episodes ago now that I wanted to be able to share that story with you about how God provided for us. And this past Sunday night, I had the opportunity at my church to preach a message that I've entitled, What God Has Taught Me About Prayer. What God Has Taught Me About Prayer, and showing me some things that I've learned and talking and sharing those with others about what God has taught me about prayer along this path and along this journey and His provision. And I incorporate into that message the story of how God provided for us. So I wanted to share that story with all of the Sandy Creek Stirrings crowd, and uh, but first I wanted to share it with my church family, so I've now done that, and now I want to share it with you. So I'm going to be playing for you that message that I preached Sunday night. And it's not really a preachy message. It's not really, it's it's more of me, can I just put it this way? It's more of me giving testimony of what the Lord has done in my life. So many have come up to me and said that it was an encouragement, it was a blessing to them, and it helped them. And I pray and hope that it'll be a blessing, an encouragement, and a help to you as well. As always, if you have any questions, you can send those into Joshua at SandyCreekStirrings.com. Again, that's Joshua at SandyCreekStirrings.com. Until next time, my friend, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. Amen. Thank you for that and for that special. Aren't you thankful that everything God touches, He changes? Amen. Uh, Mark chapter 11 tonight. Mark chapter 11. You know, I'm thankful. There's another song that says, When He Reached Down His Hand for Me. And I can remember when I was just a young boy, when God reached down His hand for me, I was lost and undone without God or His Son when He reached down His hand for me. I'm thankful He changed my life. It doesn't matter if it's a little boy or an old man, or if it's a blind man, God changes them. Amen. I heard this story, and I don't know if you've heard it before, of the blind man who was taking a trip to the state of Texas. He flew out to Texas, and he got there, and he was supposed to go on a bus ride down to the Alamo. He went down there, got on the bus, sat down. He was a blind man, so they helped him get on the bus, sat him down the seat, and he reached out for the armrest. And he reached for it. Finally, he felt the armrest. They were all the way out here. He reached out his legs, couldn't feel the seat in front of him. He said, my, he said, this is the biggest chair I have ever sat in. Guy next to him leaned over, said, well, everything's bigger in Texas. (laughs) They drove down. They went to the restaurant. He stopped off at the restaurant. He went to himself a steak dinner and a sweet tea. He said, I will have a sweet tea and a steak. They brought the steak and he felt it. He said, this is the biggest steak I have ever had. 
And then he reached for the sweet tea and it was just a barrel. And he said, my goodness, he said, this is the biggest sweet tea I have ever had. The waitress said, everything is bigger in Texas. Well, he got to the hotel room that night or to the hotel. He walked in, he checked in the lobby. He went down and he asked the, uh, the, the person there at the desk. He said, you know, I really need to use the restroom. He said, you know, which door is the restroom? She said, go down the right hall, first door on your right hand side. Well, he went down the hall. He's feeling along, missed the first door found the second door, opened it up, didn't realize he had opened the door to the indoor swimming pool. He walked in, went feet first down in the bottom of the swimming pool. At first, he didn't know what happened. He swam to the top and said, don't flush, don't flush. And everything's bigger in Texas. But I'm thankful that God even touched a blind man. Amen. And I'm sure if I was a blind man, I'd be pretty scared. And if that had happened to me. Mark chapter 11 and uh, I had a couple couple messages. I feel like I say this every time I preach lately. I had a couple messages that the Lord put on my heart and uh, several things that I wanted to preach, so I couldn't decide. So I just decided I'm going to preach all three tonight. And uh, so I don't know when we'll get out, but when all three messages, I'm just kidding. And uh, But I did um, pray about it and lean toward this one. And honestly, I don't know that it's the one that I wanted to preach um, because it's not going to be so much preaching as it's going to be... Um, teaching and challenging and sharing with you some things from my story. And um, so I'm going to give those to you tonight. Now, I'm not going to get a stool and a sweet tea and come over here and share some things with you. I hope this is a challenge and a help to you tonight. Um, a preacher had asked if, if, um, if I would be led to do so, that I'd preach on the subject of homosexuality and our response to homosexuality. And that's a different message for a different time, so you'll hear that soon. And um, But Tonight's message is going to be entitled, What God Has Taught Me About Prayer. What God Has Taught Me About Prayer. And here's what I want you to do tonight. I want you to take your pen and hopefully you carry one with you when you come to church. I believe in note taking. Amen. And so grab your pen. I want you to write these things down. And if you're someone who writes in your Bible, and by the way, I'm a big write in your Bible fan too. And uh, I carry a wide margin Bible for that reason. And um, But Mark chapter 11 tonight. But we're going to talk about what God has taught me about prayer. And I want you to take these things tonight, write them down there in your Bible and I pray and hope that there'll be a challenge and a blessing to you. And then I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to share some personal illustrations tonight from my life that I pray and hope will be a blessing to you. So Mark chapter 11, look at verse number 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he, and that he right there is Jesus, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. What God has taught me about prayer, and I pray and hope this will be a blessing to you tonight. Some things that the Lord has done in my life. We'll finish a little bit of this chapter, but let's pray first, and we'll continue. Lord, I do thank you for this opportunity to stand behind this pulpit. Lord, a place where men of God come, Lord, to give your word. And Lord, I don't feel worthy tonight to come behind here, Lord, this place and from this pulpit share with these people. But Lord, you've put something upon my heart. And so, Lord, I pray that it would be a blessing. Lord, I pray that you'd guide my words and that you'd guide my tongue. Give me the right thoughts and the right words to say. Lord, I pray that everyone would walk out tonight, Lord, having heard something from the Lord that touches their heart and encourages them and challenges them as they continue to grow in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus here in this passage is coming into, uh, coming from Bethany. They're going into Jerusalem. And right after we finish this verse, verse 14, where he curses the fig tree and the disciples heard it, he goes into Jerusalem and we have that famous scene where Jesus cleanses the temple. If you remember, he overthrows the money, changes tables. I mean, it's a, a scene of a holy and righteous anger that God has and God can display. Amen. And they leave the city that night, they leave Jerusalem, and they go back to Bethany. And then apparently, from the verses, they wake up the next morning from Bethany to go back into Jerusalem. And here's what we find in verse number 19. And when the evening was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursedest, or however you say that, is withered away. 
And Jesus answering saith unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So here's Jesus, he curses the fig tree, goes into Jerusalem, leaves Jerusalem, is coming back the next day, and the disciples are shocked. You would think by now, out of all the miracles they've seen, uh, a dead fig tree wouldn't surprise them. But they are shocked. Peter looks and here's this fig tree dried at the roots. It's not just dry at the leaves, it's dried from the roots. And Peter, can you just, I, I can see him just grabbing Jesus by the shoulder and shaking him. Look at that fig tree, it's dead, just like you said. And if I, I just think, my goodness, wouldn't you believe it now? By now, I mean, he's done so many things. He's already walked on water. I mean, it's incredible things that Christ has done. And you would think by now, Peter would believe, but here he is. This is incredible. And Jesus was using this as a lesson to teach Peter. You say, how do you know that? Because Jesus is the all-knowing, omniscient God, isn't, is he not? He is God in the flesh. And the Bible says that he saw a fig tree and he went to it to do what? Find figs. If anybody knew if there were figs on that tree, it was Jesus Christ. He's the one who created that tree. He knew uh, there's no figs on the tree. By the way, it's not even the time for figs is what the Bible says. And he goes there and he curses the tree. And you say, why would he do that? I don't know the necessary re necessarily why he curses the fig tree, but I know this. He was teaching his disciples something about prayer. And he tells Peter when Peter says, Mike, look, look at this tree. This is incredible. It's dry. Jesus says the very simple words, have faith in God. Amen. Have faith in God. I'm going to share a story here in just a little bit that I pray and hope will be a blessing to you. But as I began to study out having faith in God, I realized that in my own personal life, I was a person of prayer. I prayed. I prayed every morning. And I had been raised. We pray at mealtime. We pray before going to bed. Every night, my wife and I, before we turn out the lights, we pray before we go to sleep. Um, I, we pray before we go to bed. We pray when we break be bread. You know, that's a tongue twister there. And we pray. And I was a person of prayer. But I began to realize that I was a person who I had a, a little bit of faith, but I didn't really have much faith. And God began to challenge me some things on, on this area of faith and some things that I learned about faith that I want to share with you tonight. You know, many people get faith confused. They misunderstand what faith is. Faith is not prayer. Some people think that faith and prayer are almost the same thing. No, you can pray and not have faith. And the Bible reminds us that faith is so eloquently defined in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We're hoping for some things. We haven't seen them yet, and that's faith. I believe I'm going to heaven. I honestly believe that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. You know what that is? That's called faith. I haven't seen heaven. How many of you have seen heaven? If you have, I want to talk to you. And uh, But you haven't seen heaven yet, but I believe it. It's that evidence of things not seen. There's the faith. You know, the Bible says, and you've heard this verse before, and I won't elaborate on this point, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. If we don't have this element in our life, the Bible says we cannot please God. And Jesus Christ himself talks here in this passage about a mountain moving faith. Now, he wasn't saying that if the Israelites, if the, if the disciples prayed that they could make Israel as flat as Florida. Um, that's not what he was saying. He was using a picture that they could move mountains in their life if they only learned to have faith. If they learned to have faith. If you'll notice there, look in the, look in that passage again, look specifically at verse number 24. I found this incredible when I stumbled upon this passage in my reading. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I had always heard that God wants us to pray for our needs. In fact, Christ instructed us to pray for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread and the example of prayer. By the way, that's not a, the, the, the prayer that God, uh, that Christ gave, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is not like a, a prayer we pray. It's like an outline. It's kind of like your math teacher when you were in school. She might have wrote a math problem on the board and showed you how you answer that problem. But when you went to the test, every single problem wasn't that same one she put on the board. They were different. Jesus Christ gave an outline. Here's what you're going to pray for. Here's what it's going to look like. And you need to fill it in according to your situation. But Christ prayed. He instructed us to pray for our needs. And I always knew growing up that we pray for our needs. But this idea of pray for whatsoever ye what? Desire. I never really thought about that. We're, we can pray about what we desire, what we, what we want. God does care about our desires. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Write these references down. In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11 say, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 say, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications, with, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Let your what? Your request. Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And then Psalm 145 verse 16 says, speaking of God, Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. God cares about your desires. When I read that verse, I thought, boy... Here comes the bright, shiny, new red Corvette. Here we come. It says, desire, I want a Corvette. I'm praying for it. God promised he would answer. And then I felt the Holy Spirit say, no, 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 no. This desire is a particular desire. And God began to show me some things out of Scripture that I shared with our teenagers maybe a year ago, actually less than that, on the qualifications for your mountain-moving desire. What can I take to God? And I wrote these things down, and, and I want to give these to you real quick. Number one, I find that if I'm going to pray for something, if I have a desire and I want to know, is this something God will answer? Well, here's a list of qualifications I can go through. Number one, the desire must be good. The desire must be good. The Bible says in, 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 um, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? You say, well, uh, Brother Josh, a, a bright, shiny red Corvette would be good. I would really like that. That would be awesome. I mean, Todd is back there like, yes, good. That is good. Well, that may be good in our sight. The Bible says that there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God says, hey, there are some things that you think are good. They're not good. The question is not whether it's good in my sight. The question is, is it good in God's sight? Because if it's good in God's sight, well, he'll answer it. You say, well, how do I know if it's good in God's sight? We do that with the second qualification. The desire must not only be good, but the desire must be for God's glory. The desire must be for God's glory. Ask yourself this question. The next time you have a want, something you desire, ask yourself this. How can I use this for God's glory? Now you say, well, Brother Josh, I'm a, I'm a gun connoisseur. I got a rifle. I don't know how I would use that for the Lord. I just really want a rifle. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. The Lord might say no. You never know. But I tell you what, you've got a mountain moving desire. You say, Brother Josh, I've got this need or this desire in my life. Should I be praying for this? Well, how would you use it for God's glory? How would you use it that God would be glorified? The Bible says in John chapter 14, verses 3 through 4, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You know, God says that He answers some prayers because He wants to receive the glory. By the way, that's your whole purpose for being created is to glorify God, Isaiah 43, verse 7. I find number three, the desire must not only be good and must be for God's glory, but I find it must be founded on a promise. Founded on a promise. How many of you remember the story from Joshua chapter 10 where Joshua is fighting the Amorites and he's standing in a valley and the sun is going down and the moon is coming up and what does Joshua do? He says, sun, stand thou still. Moon, 
stand thou still. You know why Joshua had the boldness? Because I, I think you had to be pretty bold. Imagine tonight if we were standing here and we were fighting and warring and I stood in the midst and I lifted my voice and said, Son, stand still! Y'all would look at me and be like, what is he doing? What a weirdo. Look at that nut. He's telling the son to stand. I can just imagine that all the people around him stopped fighting and just stared at him for a second. Like, what is he talking about? I think he's gone crazy. Somebody hit him on the head. And, but he commands the son to stand still and the moon to stand still. How did Joshua know that would be answered? God gave him a promise. God said, you will win the war before the sun goes down. And they weren't close to winning the war, and the sun was going down. So Joshua knew there was only one way, and that sun is going to have to stand still. So with a boldness standing on the promise of God, he looked up at the sun and said, Son, stand thou still. There are going to be some desires in your life that you need to found and, 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 and put on top of a promise. Maybe you're praying for a need. Right? Needs are desires too. Amen. I, I need food and I, I want food. Amen. And so are you praying for a need? God promised he would supply your needs. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to His um, riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Maybe you've been fasting and you say, You know what? I've spent time fasting. God promised that if I fasted, He would answer. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 29, And He said to them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Maybe you haven't had an answer yet and you claim the promise that God promised He would answer. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So the desire must be founded on promise. I find next the desire must test your faith. I mean, that's the whole point of mountain moving faith, right? You're testing your faith. You're challenging your faith. And God is looking for His children, some people who believe in Him, and He's looking for people who will test their faith so He can show Himself strong in their lives. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The Bible says that God is looking all around the earth for somebody who has a right heart, and he wants to show himself strong in their lives. He wants you to test your faith. That's why God would cry out in, Mike, uh, in Malachi. He would say, prove me. Prove me now. God wants you to prove him. I find next to the desire, you must put feet to your desire. You must put feet to your desire. You must put it into action. What are you doing in your life? You say, I've got this desire in my life and I want God to answer it. Well, what have you done to put feet to your faith? And say, God, I'm, I'm trusting you and I'm taking this step of faith to believe that you'll supply. One way that we'll do that in the month of September is by faith, promise, missions, giving. I don't know. I don't know what the Lord is going to tell me yet. I have an idea of the, of the amount God wants me to give. I'll tell you now, I don't have that money to give. But you know what? I'm going to put feet to, feet to my faith that God will provide. and I'm going to fill out the card and put it in as a commitment. And I'm going to keep the commitment, amen, that's putting feet to my faith. God talks about sometimes we give financially, putting feet to our faith. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. What do you have to do first? Give. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I believe it's chapter 11, verse 1, cast thy bread upon the waters and thou shalt find it after many days. Putting feet to our faith. And then I find last, the desire must come from a clean heart. We're a Sunday night crowd tonight. You know that God will not hear our prayers if we regard iniquity in our heart. And if we want a desire to be answered, a mountain moving desire, then we must go to God with a clean heart. This message, those points, and this isn't the entire message, those points came out of a lesson that I learned. As I said, this message is entitled, What God Has Taught Me About Prayer. I told you tonight I'm going to share some things that God has done in my life. And this is the portion where I, I told God when I was praying about this message, I said, Lord, I, I don't know. This isn't really, you know, preaching. And it's more like sharing. It's more like testifying. Amen. And um, but this is what the Lord wanted. So I'm going to give it to you tonight. When my wife and I got married, uh, January, this January will make six years. When we got married, we were so in love, we were so excited to get married that we bought a little, well, I bought, and then she became my wife, so we owned it together. Um, but with a 28-foot pull-behind camper. And uh, we bought that thing, and we put it on the corner of my parents' property. And our plan was we were going to live in that camper for one year. How many of you know newlywed plans? They don't always work out. We were going to live in that camper for one year. And we were going to move out. We were going to buy a house of our own, a home of our own. Well, I, you know, I think it's okay if we share the failures that I've made in my life from the pulpit. I did not manage our finances correctly when we first got married. 
And maybe some of you have done the same when you're newly married. You think you're rich and you're not. And uh, so here I was and and uh, I didn't manage our finances correctly. And we ended up in a mess of debt, uh, maxed out credit cards. And that goal of getting into a house in one year was not an option. Well, we were married in January and we had Liberty Ann sitting here on this row. We had her in December of that year. And things were okay, you know, 28 foot pull behind camper. We made some room. We're doing all right. And then we found out freedom was coming along. I don't know if that's a scary thought to you, but being a 28 foot pull behind camper, that was a scary thought knowing girl number two was on the way. And we said, there is no way we're going to be able to make this work. So we went out and we were obviously in debt. So we only added to the debt. We went and got a $7,000 loan and went and bought a used fifth wheel camper built I mean, rednecked a 10 by 10 room on the side of it. And that's what we've been living in for the past three, four years now. And that's just where the Lord has had us. Part of it, our own failures, right? And But the Lord has taught us so much through that. I'm thankful that now I've learned some financial lessons, amen. And the Lord taught me some things. But we began praying. It was a big burden upon our heart that we would get a house. We wanted to get a place to, to live of our own. And finally, we had, we had liberty, and then we had freedom, and we had victory, and things were okay. People were asking, you know, the space, isn't it getting tight in there? Isn't it getting a little rough? And it was, but it's fine. There's a contentment when you're in the Lord's will, amen? And then we found out we were going to have Patriot, and I was no longer content. Uh, this is too many kids in a 31-foot fifth-wheel camper with a 10 by 10 room on the side. I said, this just isn't going to work. And so we had gotten out of debt by this point, and we decided we're going to work on trying to get a home. And so we began to pray and seek God's will. We applied to a mortgage company. And um, at the time, we, because we had been in so much debt, we cut up our credit card, said, we're done with this. Our credit score came, became nothing. We had no credit score. Went to a mortgage company. And I don't know, most people don't realize this, but you can get a mortgage without a credit score. And we applied for a credit score. They told us we were approved. We were good to go. And then a miracle happened. Have you ever had something happen where it was just a miracle? It's just like, God did that. God put it in the way. And the very next day, we got approved that night. The next morning, a house came on the market that we had looked at six months before. And we loved that house, didn't have the money to buy it. Six months before, we loved that house. It went off the market, came back on the market within 12 hours of us getting approved. That's just a God thing. We went and within 24 hours, we were standing on the porch of this house. It had everything we wanted. It had a fenced in yard. It, it was a big house. They had a big addition on the side. We were going through. The realtor was showing us around this house. And my wife began to pray that God would give us a piano when we got into our new house. We rounded the corner in this house and there was an old piano. And the realtor stopped and she said, now I want you to know, she said that the owners say that if you want this piano, you can have it. How many of you, that just sounds like a God thing. God is just, this is just incredible. We went outside. Now there was one small little, little problem. It was just that much out of our price range, just that much. So we rushed home. This is the house. God has opened the door. This is going to be great. We're moving into a house. We rushed home. I called the loan officer for the mortgage company. I said, hey, I need about this much more. And she said, that's good. She said, what kind of house is it? I explained it. And then she dropped the bomb on me. She said, well, I failed to tell you. How many of you like it when the mortgage people tell you? I failed to tell The bank says, well, we failed to tell you. Brother Luce, when the manufactured home company says, we failed to tell you. We were talking about this last night. and uh, But we failed to tell you. She said, I failed to tell you that because of the economy, we have canceled our manufactured home loan, pr home loan program. You cannot get a manufactured home. Now, if you know anything about Fort White, there is no other option. It's a manufactured home for my price range or nothing. And uh, so I was dejected. I was heartbroken. I thought, this is the Lord's will. I know it. This is what God wants. I was dejected. I was heartbroken. I grabbed my Bible because the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I said, God, I need to be encouraged. And you know the passage that I happened to open to that day that all this news came about? I opened up to Mark chapter 11. I began reading through, and I saw this, and I read verse 24. Whatsoever things, when you pray, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. I thought, this is God. He is testing my faith. 
So I wrote down those things. Your desire must be good. Your desire must be for God's glory. How will I use this for God's glory? Your desire. I went through this whole list. All those notes I wrote down in July of last year when we looked at this house. I said, this is it. God wants us. And Tabitha and I knew God wants us to test our faith. So we decided, you know what? We're going to believe that God is going to give us this house. We're going to step out on faith and we're going to believe that God is going to give us this place and God is going to work it all out. And we're just going to believe and we're going to trust that God will do it. So I remember we decided, well, how are we going to put feet to our faith? So we went and we decided, well, we're going to take a sum of money that's in our bank account. And we're going to put it in the building fund. So that Saturday morning, I drove down to the bank. I pulled out some money and I put it in the building fund. We said, Lord, we, we can't really give away this money, but we're going to do it. We want to put feet to our faith. Cast thy bread upon the waters and thou shalt find it after many days. We said, we're going to believe. Then we're going to fast. We're going to fast. And we fasted for a week long. Just juice, just coffee. I, I, I hate fasting for a week long. I, I'm sorry, that sounds terrible. But man, I get so hungry. And I'm a thin guy already. I need the food, amen. And uh, But we decided we're going to fast for a week long. And then we began to pray. And we began to pray. We would spend hours in prayer in the morning. Pray together in the afternoon. Pray together in the evening. And we began to pray like, honestly, we had never prayed before. I want to give you a couple things real quick. We won't be much longer. Number one, I want you to know that prayer is hard work. Prayer is hard work. Um, I don't know if your flesh is like mine, but it doesn't like to pray. It gets distracted easily. I, I, I get praying and all of a sudden I'm thinking about something else and I'm still talking, but I'm thinking about something completely different. I don't even know how I do it. And, uh, but I'm thinking about something completely different. And then I, I, you know, I draw my thoughts back into prayer and I forget what I was praying about. And have you ever done that before? How many of you be honest this morning? All right, we do that. You know, prayer is hard work. My, my flesh doesn't like to pray. The devil's pretty good at giving me some distractions, but I wanted to make sure during this time of testing my faith that I prayed and I stayed consistent. We call it the prayer of importunity, right? The prayer where that little widow lady, remember, she kept banging on the judge's door every morning and crying and saying, you got to help me. He said, go away. And she banged on the door the next morning. You got to help me. Go away every day. And finally, he said, forget it. I'll help you. The Bible talks about that prayer. Luke chapter 18, verse number seven through eight. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night, um, day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will. He will. I says, hey, you cry to me every night and day. You think I'm not going to answer. I will. I will answer, but it takes hard work. It takes effort. And so we began to pray. And I remember one night, and I'm, I'm, this is not trying to brag on myself in any way, shape, or form, because I was exhausted this next morning. But I said, you know what? I'm going to stay up and I'm going to pray all night. And God will give us this house. And I stayed up all night. I didn't stay up all the next day, but I stayed up all night and prayed that God would give us this house. I said, I want to make this work every day, morning, at noon, and right before dinner time, I would go out, I'd put my shoes on, I'd cross the yard, and I'd go out and I would pray. I'd walk in a circle. I'm a pacer. I just pace. And I would walk in a circle and I would pray. I wanted God to know that I was serious. And I found out something I learned in that situation. Prayer is hard work. I found out, number two, that prayer is patiently waiting. We, I, I don't know if you've ever prayed for something before, but typically when I pray, I think God is going to answer tomorrow. I never go into prayer expecting God to answer two months from now. I think He's going to answer tomorrow. So I wasn't praying for God to give me this house next week. I was praying for God to give me this house today. Like, have the people call me. Amen. Well, one week turned into two weeks, and two weeks turned into three weeks, and three weeks turned into four weeks, and I, I quit fasting, just to be honest with you. And I, I needed some food, amen. And so we, we kept moving forward. We kept praying. We kept moving forward. Uh, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, until it turned into 60 and 70 days. We're still praying that God would give us this house. Prayer is patiently waiting. The Bible says that I, well, I'll read it to you. Isaiah 49, verse 23. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. God says, you know what? You're going to know that I'm the Lord. And when it gets to the end of this, you're not going to be ashamed that you waited. You're not going to be ashamed of that. The Bible says, in fact, that when we wait on the Lord, he'll renew our strength. So we decided we're just going to keep patiently waiting. I learned that lesson. Prayer, it takes patience. It's not always an answer today or tomorrow. Sometimes it's years and later. And we began praying. I learned next, and I'm going to kind of jump and then we'll come back to the story real quick. I found out at the end of it all that prayer is above worth. 
I found out at the end of this entire story that I'm going to share with you tonight that prayer is above worth. I found out and I realized that prayer is such a valuable thing and how close it draws you to the Lord. I learned much more about prayer in those two months than I had learned in my 26 years of living. I learned so much about prayer and I found that prayer is above worth. Boy, prayer became a sweet thing to do. Prayer became something that I enjoyed doing. Prayer became something that I was drawn to. Prayer became above worth. Now, if you were to look at my notes tonight, you would see a big space right here. You would see a big space because I wrote this message on day 68 of us praying for that house. And I put in my notes in italics and parentheses, fill in below how God answered the prayer. Because I honestly believe God was going to answer. I learned a fourth lesson, though. That, that lesson was maybe the most critical of all. Prayer is not always answered the way we think it should be. Prayer is not always answered the way we think it should be. I had a mountain-sized desire, Brother Nelson. I took it to God. It was good. I could use it for God's glory. I could put feet to it. It was testing my faith, that's for sure, because nobody has just given a house. I mean, I'm sure some people have, but I, that's not me. I, I haven't just been given a house before. And, uh, but, but it met all those qualifications, but I found out that prayer is not always answered the way that I think it should be. You say, well, Brother Josh, doesn't that seem like an ultimate waste of time then? No, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter, I believe, 58, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. God says, you know what? There are some things you think it should be handled in this way and you think it should be done like this, but that's not my thought and that's not my way. I know what's best. I know what's best. And you may think it's good and you may have some good ideas for that, but that's not what's best. And I had to be reminded that God always gives good gifts in the end. I've already read to you where the Bible says how much, how, um, I'll read it to you real quick, but I, I also was reminded of how God, James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father. God promises good gifts to His children. And I was reminded that God, in the end, would give a good gift now, I'll be honest with you, that was a hard lesson to learn, that God doesn't answer prayer the way I think it should be sometimes, because I have some good ideas. Have you ever had a good idea in prayer? This will really work, Lord. If you'll answer it this way, I know exactly how it'll turn out. Just do it this way. I'm not omniscient. God is. And God knew some things that would work out. Well, we began praying in July and September and October and November, and finally, we thought, Lord, are you just not going to answer this request? It was almost heartbreaking invested so much time in prayer over a, over a particular subject, and you thought, Lord, you promised you would answer. Can I just remind you, sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, sometimes God says wait. I've heard many times people use the story of George Mueller. George Mueller said at the end of his life, he said, I've never had an unanswered prayer. And I always thought, that is incredible. And then I thought about it one day. I said, well, I've never had an unanswered prayer either. He said, yes, no, or wait. I always get an answer. And I always get an answer. It may not be the answer I'm looking for. But in November of that year, a preacher came along, and my dad, and he sat me down. He said, you know what, Josh? He said, your mom and I have been praying. And he said, we have these acres here. And he said, you know, in Columbia County, you can separate out an acre for your children. And he said, we, we would be content if you would take that corner acre up there, and you make that your, your home. And at first, I thought, No. Because I'm supposed to be in that house because that's what I've been praying for. I don't need this little acre over here. But Tabitha and I began to pray about it, and we felt that that was what the Lord wanted us to do. And when God closes one door, He always opens another. Right. I, I've got something with me that I brought tonight, and I hope this will be a blessing to you. But I brought my prayer journal. When I was going through all those times where I was praying, I, I, I bought this leather prayer journal because I, I found out that the more I prayed, the more I had requests. And so I, I decided I needed a bigger notebook. So I bought a, a three ring binder that I could add pages into. And at the very back of the binder, you'll find a page. Well, you're not going to find it because I'm not going to show it to you. But a, a journal of blessings. And, um, but you'll find where I journal the blessings of God. I began to write down how God would supply the need. Well, when we begin, and let me share this story with you, we won't be long. When we began to look at this piece of property, the very first thing we needed was we needed money for the survey for the land. 
That had to be done because they have to survey the acres that he owns and then survey the acre that I will soon own. And they've got to separate those two out. And well, if you remember just a little while before, Tabitha and I had put feet to our faith and said, you know, Lord, we're going to give this money to the building fund. And we didn't have the money for the survey. We didn't know what to do. I was dejected again. I thought, Lord, this, pro this, pro this process isn't even going to get off the ground. How's this even going to work? We can't even get to base one. And I've got written down in my prayer journal where I wrote a blessing down, December 11th, 2021. And I didn't ask this family if I could share their name, so I won't until I get their permission. But a family asked us if they could meet us at an ice cream shop there in High Springs and talk to us. And they said, you know what, I wrote this down. They, they wanted to tell us that they were going to pay for the survey for the potential land divide. Amen. God said, give and it shall be given unto you. Here's somebody who said, you know what, we want to pay for that potential land divide. I didn't have the money, but God through them supplied the need. Amen. And God supplied the money. I've got a note here next. I've got here December 21st of 2021. We went back to our mortgage lender and said, hey, we need the money. We've already been approved. We just need the money now to buy a manufactured home. They denied us. They said, nope, you're denied. We went to another manufactured home company and they said, you are denied. I said, well, Lord, what can I do with a piece of property that I have no money with? I, I'm not, Tabitha's not going to do the tent. I mean, the camper was one thing, but getting into a tent, that's a different story. We'll leave that to Abraham, amen? And uh, I said, that's not going to work. And, but the Lord had his hand upon it all. I mean, here in January 13th, 2022, let me read you what I wrote. We have been praying for a house, and though things are moving slowly, God is already providing to meet our needs. And just the week, past week and a half, God has provided for us a homeschool table, a dining room table, chairs, uh, a sofa, a recliner. Kleiner, China, um, silverware. We didn't even have a house yet. It was all stored back here in the back of the church. If you were back there and couldn't get in the door, that's where all our stuff was. And God was just saying, hang on, I've got this under control. I've got a note here that um, if you remember, we didn't have a credit score. And finally, they said, if you want to, if you want a mortgage, you're going to have to get a credit score because of the economy right now. We normally offer it without a credit score, not happening. So a gentleman gave us a way we could get a credit score. We ended up getting a credit score in a month. We reapplied. We got the credit score. We're moving forward. We have put in the application. Things are good. Got a call before church. You've been denied. I said, you wanted a credit score. We got a credit score. And now you're telling me we're denied. And so I called them up. I said, would a down payment make a difference? And they said, no, because you still don't have a credit score. I said, what are you talking about? I have a credit score. They said, well, we didn't pull it. You put your last application in within 60 days, so we don't pull it. I said, pull it. <laughs> so she said, that's a good idea. She went and pulled it. Before church, we got a call. You've been approved. Yeah. You know what it was? It was a little roadblock. God said, hey, I'll open the door up for you. I've got another note here. Um, it says we were approved. Amen. <laughs> Problems with the front of the property. So here we go. We're getting the survey done and we come along and there's 30, there's a 30 foot wide strip that runs a lot across the front of our property that I found during the survey. We don't own. When you drive in my, when you drive on my driveway, brother Alderman, for the first two cars, we don't own that. Somebody else's property. I got a driveway on it. But the survey company told me, they said, hey, if you want to get on your property, you have got to find the owner and get an easement. I said, oh boy. So I called the owner. I found their name. I called them. They didn't pick up. I drove to their house. I brought a letter. Here's what I need. I just need an easement. And I brought a letter. I knocked on the door. Lady answered the door. I gave her the letter. I said, here's what I need. Here's what I'm asking for permission to put in a driveway on this 30 foot wide strip of land. And she said the dreaded words that I knew she was going to say. Well, we'd be interested in selling you that property. I thought, I don't have the money to buy this property. And I, I got back in the car and Honestly, I was dejected again. I thought, Lord, every time I try to do something, the door closes. And pretty soon I got a call. We began praying. I got a call. And the husband said, you know what? Just do it. It's fine. I'll give you a signature and you'll have a signed piece of paper. Another door that God owned. We went up to the Columbia County Zoning Department. We brought our paperwork in to get that acre separated out. We went up to the Columbia County Zoning Department. I set my paperwork, the survey, everything. We need to get this filed so we can separate it out. She said, well, I see a big problem. She said, you have to have 160 feet of road frontage. She said, you have 135 feet. She said, that survey is just inaccurate. You're going to have to have it completely redone. I said, Lord, 
This is, this is, I don't know if you're trying to tell me no or to keep having faith. And, uh, but she said, well, hang on. She said, let me go talk to a lady. She said, you weren't told that. She went to the back, came out a minute later. She said, you know what? You weren't told the proper information. She said, we're just going to approve you. When has the zoning department ever changed their rules? They broke their own rules and they missed out on more money. I don't know why, but they did it. But God opening another door. Uh, we were approved for our loan February 16th of 2022. We picked out the house. The land clearing. We needed to go ahead and clear the land to get the property all set up. Here, Brother Nate, he's not here tonight, he's sick, but he said, hey, I will help you, Brother AJ, I'll help you get the land cleared. We're going to charge you this small amount. I mean, very, very small amount compared to what they could have charged for land clearing. We're going to charge this, and we're going to get it ready to go. Nate had surgery on his back. We waited two weeks. He said, I'm good to go. Night before land clearing started, he popped all the stitches in his back. I said, here we go again. Here we go again. I called some companies. I found a company that would clear it for the same price. God allowed me to find somebody. And Brother Nate said, I'm so glad we didn't have to do that. If you've ever been to my property, you've seen all those rocks lining the driveway. All of those came out of my dirt. There were two dump truck loads of those rocks that are this big that came out from my dirt. All those ones, there were guys driving up with trailers, picking up those rocks with tractors. Nate said, I would have still been out there working to try and clear your property. God had a hand in all of it. Furniture was still coming on March 9th. Um, our agent for the manufactured home company quit, never filed our paperwork. We found that out a month afterwards, but God kept it moving. Um, then we had the appraisal. They said, you know, with uh, this whole package deal, the land's got to be part of it. And your land has to be appraised, Brother AJ, for $25,000. I said, okay, you know, good market, $25,000, no problem. They said, if it doesn't come back at $25,000, you have to come up with the extra cash to be able to move forward. I said, no problem. $25,000, no sweat. The appraisal came back on April 5th of 2022 at $14,000. They said, hey, if it doesn't come at twenty five, dollars you're either going to be denied or you got to come up with the extra cash. I said, I don't have $11,000, Brother Burling. I just don't have $11,000 sitting in my back pocket. I, that was gut-wrenching. I thought, Lord, you're closing the door again. But I checked the next morning and they had put approved on my statement. What is happening? I called them up. I said, I think you clicked the wrong button. It says approved. I think you meant to click denied. And she said, no, we just decided to approve you. I said, that's not what I was told. You told me I was going to have to come up with $11,000. And she said, well, we just decided to approve you. You're good to go. So I wish you would have called me and told me that last night. I didn't sleep at all. The Lord opened another door. We signed 120 closing documents, Brother brother Luce. We signed all those. We found out the guy had allotted a certain amount of money for our well. He said, $4,000, get you a well. No problem. No problem. $4,000. And he was right. $4,800. A guy could do a well six months from now. I said, that's not going to work. And so everybody else was two months to a year out at $7,000. So I began calling and God led me to the right guy who would get it in in two weeks and allow that all financially to work out. Our house was delivered on May 30th of 2022. Steps were put in. The septic tank, the septic tank company ran out of tanks. There was none in the state of Florida, they said. I don't believe them, but they said that. They found another company who would give them a tank. The electricity, they said, we can't bring electricity on your property. I said, why not? They said, it runs down Rockway. You don't own that front. And they said, no electricity running down the front of your property. I said, what? No electricity. I don't know if Tabitha is going to we'll go with that. And uh, I might, but I don't know if Tabitha is going to go with that. And uh, they said, the only way we can get you electricity is you're going to dig a 500 foot trench from the corner of your parents' property all the way under their property. And you're going to lay conduit two and a half inch, six dollars a foot. And we're going to run the electricity through that. I said, I don't have that much money laying around. They ended up coming out and God allowed a different scenario to work out for us to get electricity. The, I, I've got many more notes in here that I could read you, but I won't to save time. July 1st, we finally moved into that house that God provided. And I say God provided because, did you hear all those problems? There's no way this should have worked out, but God did it. I found out prayer is hard work. Prayer is patiently waiting. Prayer is not always answered in the way we think it should be, and prayer is above worth. You know, when I got to the end of the whole thing, I looked back, and you know, when you get to the end of it, you're always thankful for the answer God gives. That's right. It wasn't the answer you started with, 
but you're so thankful. I believe that God took all that time we put in prayer and He said, you know what? I know you want it towards this house. I'm going to credit it all towards this account over here. You know, something very special. Every day, if you remember, I told you I'd walk out in the morning. I'd go down those steps. Tabitha would watch me from, we had a big picture window in our fifth wheel. She'd watch me go down those steps and I would go out to the woods. There was a circular goat pen. I would go behind the goat pen and I would walk in a circle behind that goat pen and pray that God would give us a house. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. I would give you the reference, but I can't remember it right now. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. You know, as I prayed, walking that circle every morning, every noon, and every night, God said, hey, I'm able to give you much more than this. You're praying for this over here. I'm able to do better. I can do better. And he did do better, by the way. If you could see the house we were looking at compared to the house we're in, he did better. Red carpet is not necessarily the nicest carpet. And that old house had red carpet. God can do better. You know, every day I walk that circle, never realizing that that circle I walked would be my very front yard that I own today. God said, I'm able to do better. Now you say, where's the challenge in that for me? If I were to ask you, tell me a mountain moving story, what would you tell me? If your kids or your grandkids said, dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, tell me a mountain moving story, something where God moved a mountain in your life, what story would you tell them? My story matters to me. I hope you enjoyed it, but you may have sat there been like, okay, we should be out by now. This is kind of boring because it's not your story. But what is your story? If you were called up to come up here tonight and testify and say, what mountain has God moved in your life? When did you test your faith? When is the last time you put God to the test? What would your answer be? Or have you put him to the test at all? That's my story. But what would be yours? Have you put God to the test? Can I say that God cries out to you the same thing he cried out in the Old Testament? Prove me now herewith and see if I shall not pour you out a blessing. God wants to give you a blessing. God wants to bless you. God is looking to make himself strong in your life if you only step out in faith. Can I challenge you this week? Whatever desire it is that you're praying about, remember, it's hard work. It's patiently waiting. It may not be answered in the way you think it should be, but you'll be thankful for the answer at the end. And most of all, prayer is above worth. Oh, how sweet it is to have a walk with God. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looks.